Please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce the 25th Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter. This is Secretary Carter's first visit to Iraq as the SecDef, and the second time this month he's visited with 82nd Airborne Division paratroopers. It's quite an honor for our division, and we hope he's a longtime friend of the All-Americans. Although the Secretary obviously chose a career of distinguished civil service, I have it on good account that he secretly wishes he'd started out as a paratrooper. But it's not just the All-Americans here. Just like when we're home at Fort Bragg, we are part of a team. Mr. Secretary, we have seated before you a selection of the finest soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines from a variety of different special operations and conventional forces who are working together and with our coalition partners to achieve this difficult mission. They are training our Iraqi partners, advising and assisting various Iraqi commands and units, and providing force protection and other critical mission support activities. Collectively, these service members are making outstanding contributions each and every day. Sir, I won't take any more of your time, and I want to thank you for stopping here to talk with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Carter. Thanks, Curtis. Can you guys hear me? It turns out I know Curtis. I, he and I go back a, a ways. Uh, and moreover, uh, and, and this is the real uh, point here. I, uh, by the way, it's hotter than hell in here. Do you guys mind if I take this, take this off? Appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's really hotter than real hell outside. Actually, they were going to do this. I, th I think we were going to do it in a hangar. Aren't, aren't you all glad to be in here? I sure am. Uh, Listen, uh, so I've been in the region here for uh, 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 whatever, three, four days now, and I've seen a lot of important people in a lot of capitals, but you're the most important people to me, and I just want you to know that. Uh, you guys, uh, you are what matters to me, you're why I wake up every morning, you're what I'm thinking about every day, it's you, uh, you, uh, your families, um, my wife and I uh, got a chance to be with some of your very own uh, family members uh, down at Bragg, uh, whatever, last week or so, uh, and she had an opportunity to talk to them while I watched some of your fantastic colleagues jump out of an airplane, which I, I do want to do, or I maybe let put it this way, I want to ha have done. Uh, but I'm not sure I want to do. Maybe I'm getting to the point where I shouldn't be trying to do that, but I did get to watch. But Stephanie uh, met with some of your families and talked to them. Obviously, they miss you, but they're incredibly proud of you. And they were glad to hear how proud we are uh, of you. Um, uh, uh, I'll be real brief here, because it is warm, and what I, I, I want to give you all a chance to ask questions uh, of me or make comments or whatever you want to do, and then I want to get a chance to uh, look everybody in the eye, shake their hands, and, and thank you personally uh, for what you do. So, uh, and that's uh, the first thing I want to say is thank you. I don't take it for granted uh, that you're here. I don't take it for granted that your families are back there. I don't take it for granted that it's uncomfortable here, that you put yourself in harm's way, uh, and uh, that you're doing that uh, for your fellow citizens uh, of the United States, because our first job is to protect uh, our people and our country, uh, but also because of who we are, we contribute to the security of the wider world. And it is a big world out there, and we have responsibilities all over it. And that gets me to the second part, which is why what you're doing here is so important. Let me put a little context. Um, you, uh, I'm going to take this out here if I can. Um, I, as I said, you know, we have, we have responsibilities all around the, the, the world as the most uh, powerful and influential uh, power in the world, and of course, the one that everybody wants to work with, because they like us, because they like who we are, and what we stand for, and the way we conduct ourselves. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a compliment, but it's also a big burden. Uh, the Middle East is an important place in the world. It's not the only important place in the world, but it's a very important one to our country and to world security, and Iraq is an important part of the Middle East. Um, the, uh, uh, the campaign against Daesh, I, uh, I, I, first of all, the first thing I'd tell you is I don't have any doubt that we'll win because 
uh, civilization always wins over barbarism. Uh, the many always win over the few. Uh, so we're going to defeat Daesh. Uh, I don't have any doubt about it. Um, and if all there was to it was to beat them once, you could do it. Uh, and, and, but that's not, of course, the issue. Uh, the, the, the defeat we need to uh, uh, give to Daesh is a lasting defeat, a defeat that sticks. And that can only be done if we're supporting the people who live here. We can beat Daesh because we're the most powerful force in the world. But we, to, to keep them beaten requires the capable, motivated forces here in Iraq, and that requires the, the support of the Iraqi people. And so we can help them, we can enable them, we can train them, we can equip them, we can support them, but we can't substitute for them because we don't live here and we can't keep them dash beat, dash, I've been calling it all day because I've these people with ISIL, uh, we can't keep them beaten. Only the people who live here can keep them beaten. And so you're, that's why your mission is to help the Iraqis, along with all the other countries that are part of the coalition, to win back their sovereignty and their peace in their own territory. Um, we're headed in the right direction. As I said, if it were only up, up to us, it would be more straightforward. But it's not. We, have, we're, we, we need to work with, by, and through them. Uh, and that's what we're doing, and that takes some time, and it takes some effort, but that's what it takes to make victory stick uh, when we have victory. Uh, and uh, you uh, are, uh, that, that's your mission here. I don't have any doubt that we'll succeed in that mission, but it's going to take some time. We're headed in the right direction. We're making some progress. Um, we need to make more. We're trying to work harder, trying to get them to do more. We're willing to do more when and if they develop uh, capable and motivated forces of their own that can take territory and hold territory, helped by you, but again, not replaced by you or substituted by you. We know from experience that doesn't work. It doesn't stick. Um, the, uh, uh, I had a chance to talk to the leaders of the country uh, today and the, 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 they to a person I spoke to understand that and they at least are committed to that. Uh, so we hope that they can deliver that and if they do we will support them and we'll go uh, uh, I guess as you guys would say all the way uh, and so I don't have any doubt that we'll go all the way. Well, so all the way? Doesn't that Ooh. ring any bell with anybody? If I say all the way, what kind of, you know, 82nd Airborne Fleet people are you? Um, so anyway, that's, that's the second thing I wanted to say to you. Is, uh, first thing is thanks, and the second thing is why, uh, in my own words, we appreciate what you're doing here and what your mission is. Um, with that, uh, let me turn things over to you. I'll ask you all... Um, to, there's some mics around and you can ask me questions or, or you can just tell me something uh, that's on your mind or on your family's mind and I'll do my best to, to uh, answer you and then I look forward to looking at everybody in the eye and shaking their hand. All right, hey, I'm, I'm Captain Kaiha, work with uh, Brigade Headquarters at 382. And uh, as you said, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things going on in a lot of regions of the world, a lot of important places. You know, this obviously is one that's very important, especially if we've been called here uh, to, to help the citizens and to have that, that victory that lasts, like you spoke of. But can you tell us, sir, what is it that keeps you up at night? Like, what is that one thing that just has you tossing and turning uh, for a man that's seen so much and done so much? Well, uh, a, a lot of people ask me that question, and I'll, I'll tell you a, a couple of things. First, first of all, uh, it's, not just, it's not one thing because of who we are. It's a big, complicated world out there, and we're looked to for lots of things. Uh, and the second thing is, you know, I sleep pretty well because I'm very confident in our country. Uh, and I, 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 I'm an optimist about the future. We're tremendously powerful. 
as I said, were tremendously well liked. Um, so, uh, I, and of course, we, there are things that uh, in every day there's something, and every day you and your colleagues are combating uh, a threat somewhere around the world. I also, though, as I, as I work on and, 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 and uh, uh, your, uh, your commanders and everybody back in Washington work on today's problems, I try to do something else, which is I also say to myself, what is going to keep up the guy who comes after me or after me, after me, after me sometime in the future? What's going to keep that man or woman up? And what do I owe them? What do I owe to the future? What do I owe people in your generation, your children? What do we owe them? So it's not, it, 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 it's not just what keeps me up at night. Part of what keeps me up at night is the duties that make sure that the, somebody in the future isn't kept up uh, by something uh, uh, far worse. And that's why we try to take actions that prevent things from getting out of control, that get worse, from having weapons of mass destruction spread, cyber, uh, and why we keep the finest fighting force the world has ever known uh, in the United States of America now and in the future because we owe that to the generations that come after us. So they're not up at night, like too many people right here in this country. They're up at night. That's what, what we owe our people is to, that they can go to sleep at night knowing that they're safe. That's what you do for them. That's the wonderful thing about being part of this institution. You get to go to bed every night knowing that you have been part of something bigger than yourself, which is safeguarding your your country. There's nothing nobler than what you all do. I know it's hard, but there's nothing nobler than what you do. Yep. Sir, do you think uh, military recruiters should be armed in their offices? The question was, should military recruiters be armed in their offices? And, uh, you know, obviously our uh, hearts go out uh, to the families, the five folks uh, that, uh, I mean, or that were, um, uh, 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 that we lost in Chattanooga, um, and uh, that uh, saddens me. It also kind of angers me because I, uh, it, um, we, I guess I have to be careful. We don't know exactly what happened here and what this guy did and who this guy was and so on. There are a lot of people with uh, strange motivations out there, possibly inspired. Uh, but I don't know. But the question was, should people in recruiting offices be armed or not? And I'll tell you, I don't know the answer to that yet because I d I'm waiting to hear back from the services about that. We have taken some steps to increase force protection, which is the most important thing we do, is protect one another. For me, keep you safe. Um, and so we took immediately after Chattanooga some steps to um, uh, increase force protection, and then I've asked the services to take a look, because one, one question is whether we arm people, but there are other things that we need to consider uh, do another, and give me their recommendations about the whole portfolio of things, including this question, uh, that we should do to um, make sure that our, our people are kept safe at recruiting stations. We need to recruit. Uh, but we can't put people at unnecessary risk uh, as well. So I want to I want to give them a chance to think about it, the commanders and so forth, uh, hear back from them, and then I'll make decisions sometime in the next few days. Staff Sergeant Bertram, Bravo Company, One P. Uh, real quick, sir, with the uh, nuke deal in Iran, how do you see that affecting us going forward in Iraq, uh, especially when it relates to the Shia militias? So the question was, what what about the nuclear deal in Iran? Does it affect things here? And uh, I've been traveling around the region, and a, a bigger version of that question has been asked almost everywhere I, I stopped. And, and uh, you know, basically, the Iran nuclear deal, which is a good deal in the sense that it, uh, it will stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, is about Iranian nuclear weapons. It's not about everything else Iran does. Um, and so, uh, I continue to be concerned about Iranian malign activity in the region to include here uh, and the possibility of Iranian aggression and the possibility that Iran will not obey the agreement 
which we'll find out because we've there's got to be inspections and verified and and so forth, which is why we will keep the military option, which is the alternative to a, a deal. We will keep that and continue to improve uh, that. So we're going to keep doing what we do, whether there's a deal or whether there's not a deal, here and everywhere else uh, around the region. And that's the basic uh, answer uh, uh, to the question. It solves one very important problem if it is approved, and then if it is implemented, which as I said, we'll know because we inspect it, but it doesn't solve all problems uh, over in this part of the world, and it doesn't solve all problems emanating from, uh, from Iran. So we still have our job to do. Oh, well, one of the things we're saying is it's a, an agreement that places important limitations upon Iran, places no limits on us. And it doesn't place any limits on anything we do with anybody in this uh, region. So we're going to keep on keeping on with everything we're doing here to protect ourselves, uh, protect ourselves against terrorists, and protect our friends and interests here. None of that will change. Sir, Captain Matt Carsonson, uh, Third Brigade, 82nd. Sir, uh, how do you see operational tempo changing here? As, uh, as you say, we're moving in the right direction. But as we look at the 10 to 20 year campaign, and we look at an additional 40,000 cuts to the Army and two brigade combat teams. What sort of change do you see, sir? Uh, well, here uh, I would say that uh, the uh, whether and when we do more here w is going to depend upon what the Iraqis are able to do in terms of fielding capable and motivated forces. Because everything we do and the other rest of the coalition do, will do will be in support of that. And uh, so it's possible that we'll need to do more and have, an, have, have the opportunity in the sense to do more uh, when they get more uh, proficient. And obviously we're hoping that they do. More motivated, more proficient, more able to carry on the fight themselves. Then we and the rest of the coalition can help them uh, uh, more. But it's just important always to keep in the back of our mind, we can't substitute for capable and motivated Iraqi security forces. We can help them, but we can't substitute for them. And, and you, you, you also asked about resources in general. I guess uh, uh, worth, worth addressing that it, yes. as well. Resources for, the, for defense in general, was that the, yes. uh, the, the, the question? Well, obviously, we don't have as much money as we would like, and we have more budget turbulence than is uh, really responsible for any country to have. This has been going on now for several years, and it's wasteful, and it's dangerous, it's embarrassing, uh, all this business about sequester and so forth. So I don't have anything good about that to say. It's no good uh, for us, and, and we shouldn't be doing this uh, as a country. And I, I have to live with it. I understand that. Uh, but I don't like it, and there's no reason why we should like it. We're gonna, we are doing our best within it, and by doing our best, I mean uh, just to boil it down to how each of you experience this. Uh, we have so much money in the budget, and so then we have to say to ourselves, how do we use what we have? So I could, for example, pay you more, which you deserve. Because you, I mean, in a certain way, you, we quit, we can't pay you people enough for what you do. Or, I, but I can't do that and have enough of you at the same time. So I can take away the person to your left and the person to your right, and pay you more. And then I have to think about how do I get money to equip you, right? Because you want the best and newest equipment as well. Well, so I got to think about how to balance that uh, uh, in there as well. And then I never want you to go anywhere or do anything without being trained for that mission. So I want to make sure I have money for training, too. So when you get to compensation, size of the force, equipment for the force, training for the force, those are the pots that the defense budget goes into. And if we only have so much money, we've got to try to balance across those four pots so that you get the best overall package that you possibly can. That's what we're struggling to do within this. Now, that would be hard enough with any amount of money, but it's not only the amount of money, it's the turbulence. It's the upsy-downsy every 
every year, the sort of herky-jerky nature of this thing that's been going on for three or four years. I think that was what makes it particularly difficult and, and really irresponsible. How's it going, sir? Staff Sergeant Walker, Bravo Company. Uh, I have a two-part question, actually. Uh, with the 40,000 troop withdrawal over the next two years, with the VA system being broken the way it is, have you guys taken into accountability? You're throwing 40 more thousand, you know, families into a broken system. You know, has you know, as far as, uh, have you guys give, given that some thought? And the uh, second part is, with the budget the way it is, let's say before you guys start the withdrawal process, the budget, you know, writes itself, will that 40000 still be, you know, cut down? Uh, I, I don't know, there, everybody got that, but one is, if with 40,000 folks, now this is in the Army, uh, with the drawdown in Army end strength uh, occurring, uh, the question was, have I given any thought to the fate of those 40 people? So let me, let me start with that one. Very, I, I give it a whole lot of thought. I mean, I, uh, you know, I don't, uh, uh, in an ideal world, we'd never have any in, uh, involuntary or, or, or required separations. Uh, I'm trying to deal with the hand we're dealt, uh, budgetarily and also strategically, uh, because uh, with, uh, w when the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were at full tilt, the army needed to, to uh, uh, make its investments heavy on people because of the big rotational needs of coming in and out of Afghanistan and no, nobody wanted you guys deployed all the time or even half the time. And so we needed a big rotation force. Uh, and it, we're in a different strategic era now. So the Army leadership has decided, and I think they're absolutely right, that they don't need the large numbers that they needed. That's a strategic thing, that's not a budget thing. But it makes sense. But it still begs the, your question, which is what, it, what happens to the people uh, who, who go out, and I do care about them, and, in, and I think the best thing that is going on, and we can't take all the credit for that in the, in the government, uh, a lot of people in business can take credit for it, and above all, it's, it's a credit to our people, is that many of those folks are doing very well in the economy. The economy's picking up, but the main thing, the main thing is this, employers, and I hear this all the time, think you guys are great employees. Uh, they, they, they think you're skilled, they think you're motivated, they think you're organized, they think that you have had experience um, that is beyond your years. All that's true. And so our vet, I go, I'm out there and I'm out talking all the time about veterans employment, talking up how good our people are and so forth. Um, and, you know, I'm old enough to remember when it was different, and people had a different picture of us, and, and the picture now is very positive and very good for employment. So that's something bright on the side of what is otherwise not uh, 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 something that anybody would welcome, except that the Army has decided, and I think they have very good budget and strategic reasons, that they don't need all the people they needed at the height of the Iraq and Afghanistan. War. It's that it's just that simple, and they have to do what is responsible uh, within their budget for the country overall, strategically, and for the army overall. Oh, okay. Uh, can I do one more? Special skirt. Special curtain, Charlie Company, One Panther. Um, how do you, with expanding on the previous two questions, how do you expect us to do more with less, and what does that look like for us for involvement with contractors and whatnot? Well, I mean, you can't literally do more more with less. Obviously, we can get uh, more efficient. In uh, people are always looking for more efficiency 
in society and the economy and businesses and so forth, we can get uh, uh, more efficient and we can certainly get more efficient in terms of, of contracting. Um, but, um, uh, uh, you know, a hard budget situation makes us make hard choices. And, uh, and also a changing world makes us uh, make hard choices. If we're going to stay the best, which we need to, we need to keep up and keep changing. So we need to change even if we didn't have this budget situation. But we have that on top of it. So we've got to, we've got to be agile, we've got to be dynamic as an organization, and generally we are. There's no more uh, um, oh, uh, no better learning organization, I think, in American society than the U.S. military. We're, all, we're very good at it. Okay. Uh, with that, I'll stop here and then let me uh, shake everybody's hand, look you in the eye, and do and 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 say once again what I said at the very beginning, which is thanks for what you're doing out here. It means a great deal to us. It's historic work. We're extremely proud of you. Oh, also, sorry. Uh, if you didn't get a question and you have a question or a family member ha has questions, you can get me on uh, Facebook also, and I'll try to respond uh, to that. What do you think of that? <laughs>